Lewis, uh, one of the native North Arkansians, to be with us. Um, he went to dental school and got his oral surgery training at the University of Tennessee, where I did my training as well. He uh, moved to Rogers in 1980, married Mary. She was an RN. They have four children, 10 grandchildren. He's retired now, and he waited just long enough for his son to finish his training so he could take his place. Um, he, is, he was boarded by the American Board of Oral, Ma Oral Maxillofacial Surgeons. He's a fellow of the American Association of Oral Maxillofacial Surgeons. He is a fellow, uh, a fellow of the American uh, Academy of Cosmetic Surgery. And his son, Paul, like I said, has taken his place at um, their office there, uh, just down the street from mine in Rogers. But the reason why he's here is because he got heavily involved in missions uh, and helping people that had no other way of being helped but by good old Americans reaching out to help countries that don't have the services and people that don't have the ability to get treatment like they were able to render. So he was also director of the Maxillofacial Surgery Operation New Life from 2008 to 2020. So Dr. Lewis? Thank you for coming and sharing what God has done through you with us today. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm really happy to tell you about a very uniquely Arkansan mission effort. Um, so in 2004, let's see, is this? Oh, there we go. So in 2004, um, two doctors from Little Rock. Uh, Dr. Bill Alfonso, who trained right behind me at Tennessee, and Dr. Chris Shoemake, who was a plastic surgeon, um, felt the call to go out and do mission work, you know, and they kind of didn't know where to start. So they fumbled around um, Honduras, they fumbled around Guatemala, uh, they stuck their nose into Nicaragua, uh, and eventually found that the, the uh, city of Tegucigalpa, Honduras, um, offered an amazing opportunity. Tegucigalpa is about two million people, and as they will tell you, give or take a million, because they're 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 counting and taxation and all that's really not very accurate. Um, initially, uh, they met with a, a wealthy gentleman who had his own private hospital. Uh, it was a hospital every bit the equivalent of Mercy or Washington Regional. Uh, it dealt to a, a very specific upper level clientele. Uh, he threw the doors open to them and allowed them to have the run of the place. It, however, didn't really provide the patient flow that they were looking for. So they continued to look and they found this hospital in Tegucigalpa called Hospital Escuela. And so if you know <coughs> any Spanish at all, you know that that means basically hospital school. Okay, so this is where the medical school is, the nursing school is. Um, this is where all of the residents who, after they complete uh, medical school in Honduras, they all train here. Uh, and so um, this is where the, the mission really got off the ground. Um, there, there are basically two parts to our missionary effort. Oh, let me back up. Let me back up. Tell you a little bit more about ONL. So, so ONL originally started... Uh, as sort of a maxillofacial plastic surgery emphasis. Uh, as we began to talk to our colleagues, we found that there were a lot of other people that were interested. And so over the course of time, we had ENT, general surgery, OBGYN, family practice, ophthalmology, hand surgery, and then probably one of the most meaningful was a, a burn team. If you live outside the city of Tegucigalpa, you live in a hut. You live in a, a dirt floored hut with no running water. You catch your water off your roof into a cistern. You have a community privy uh, and you cook all your meals on an open fire in the center of your hut. Kids being kids, they're in the house wrestling, running around and inevitably you know, Tommy knocked Susie into the fire, okay? They go then into Hospital Escuela, and boy, when we got there, the burn care was like medieval. 
it was it was just like oh my gosh so we went out and recruited a burn surgeon went down there and actually built a burn or a burn unit they had failed to appreciate how prone to infection these people were and so that was really one of the probably most meaningful things our group our group did so uh, what you see here um, is uh, on your left um, we have we have four in-country Hondurans who work with us year-round and so this thing built up to the point where basically we had a team in Honduras about every other week okay uh, through the course of the 14 years that I went I went twice a year for a week every year and there was probably four or five years that I went three times a week uh, Jan my nurse who's with me gosh almost 30 years uh, went okay she can tell you about it I promise you she remembers maybe best the air flight into Tegucigalpa okay Tegucigalpa has a reputation as being the second most dangerous airport in the world just before one of our trips went down there the airplane carrying the Peruvian ambassador to Honduras went off the one ray crashed into the highway and killed him and his whole staff so it used to be that um, American who we flew only had four crews certified to fly in and out of Tegucigalpa and so you came down you flew this mountain pass and you dropped down below the mountains and if you were sitting on the left side of the airplane and you looked out the window you could see a guy's house even with the with the window and we were so close that you could look in there and see him watching television okay so we flew down between these things and we made a hard left turn came over a hill and then basically made this kind of aircraft carrier style landing boom on this thing full reverse of course every time the plane finally stops the whole place just breaks out in applause because you know you, you made it uh, but anyway so I'm sure Jan will remember that so anyway um, we, we have essentially two efforts on our team as we go down there we have a, a a more classic mission ministerial team that you'll hear me refer to as our prayer team and then we have a health care provider team um, and so um, after a couple of years of going down there, Dr. Alfonso decided to take the more general administrative um, role and, and, and dump maxillofacial surgery on me, which was great because I loved it. Uh, so anyway, so uh, the guy on the right is actually Dr. Alfonso's uh, brother, Vince. He's one of our major missions. Uh, this is actually the uh, pediatric cancer wing uh, where we start. And then Henry on the left is one of our four translators sort of in-country organizers so uh, this is dr. Bill Alfonso and you can see that uh, what he's basically doing is teaching the two people on the right are both Hunter and plastic surgery residents um, they were both outstanding residents the lady on the far right has some of the best surgical hands I've ever seen in my life unbelievable this is his wife Sandra and so where Bill ran the uh, surgical team, Sandra ran the prayer team. And uh, they don't travel just with us when we do the maxillofacial groups. They travel with many of the other teams. You know, if I've been 30 times to Honduras, they've been 100. Okay. Um, this was kind of a family affair. That's my wife on the back left. And this is actually my daughter. She went down as a translator. These are some of the volunteers. On the right is a nurse from Children's, a surgery tech from Children's, and then on the left is Elizabeth, who Jen knows very well. And you're gonna love this, Jen. We've always said that Elizabeth is an angel. And so when we were out in this one place, I made her get in front of this and have her picture made. So the people who go down here volunteer their time. They pay their own way. They generally are taking a week of their vacation time to do this, okay? Uh, this is Dr. Jamie Elliott, an anesthesiologist from Rogers. He took his wife and his oldest daughter down there uh, for a week. 
majority of the people who go are from Arkansas. We can be very proud of that. But as the word spread, we had surgeons from the Chicago area, surgeons from Colorado, South Carolina, Tennessee. Um, and as, the, as our program got going a little bit better, um, some, of the, some of the training programs said, hey, we would like to send you know, a young training surgeon down there with you. And so um, Carl Clinic in uh, Chicago sent s resident surgeons down three years in a row. Um, Tennessee sent resident surgeons twice. And then uh, my son who trained at Alabama uh, went actually several times. They don't have anything in Honduras, okay? Wrap your hands around this figure. The average Honduran family lives on $800 a year. A year, not a day or a month, a year. So they don't have squat, okay? They really don't. So when we go down there, the hospital has just the most basic supplies and stuff. We have to take our own anesthetic agents. We have to take our own suture, our own dressings, our own parts and pieces and stuff that I'll show you, you know, here in a minute. And so it's like a big old caravan when we come into town. Each of us has got a bag of our suitcase. I've got a, a bag um, of surgical instruments and then, and then another bag of supplies, suture, everything you can think of. Uh, we go down there on the first day and they give us this little um, kind of a closet-like thing and we set up our, our uh, inventory station and uh, then kind of go forward from there. Um, so one part of the team, the prayer team's job, is really support of the family and the patients most of the time just the ones who are interacting with us but very quickly as their reputation spread they were working throughout the hospital traditional missionary efforts sharing the gospel praying with people but in this particular case we very quickly discovered that it meant because a patient comes into the hospital from the outlying community chances are the patient and their family rode a bus they arrive with no money, nowhere to stay, no food, okay? So the patient is the best cared for one because they're lucky enough to get into the hospital and they get fed, okay? Well, we very quickly learned that we needed to feed the families and, and help, and so we were providing, good grief, blow-up pool toy mattresses for them to sleep on, you know, and uh, food. Uh, so... A lot, of, a lot of ministerial effort is done by the prayer team. Now, Hospital Escuela doesn't look very fancy. This is one wing of it. This is actually, it just happens to be the psych wing. I, it happens to be a, the, the picture that I had. It, this is the psych wing. Okay, Hospital Escuela has over a thousand beds. So if you took all of the Northwest Arkansas hospitals and combine them, this is a bigger hospital, okay? So, I mean, it, it, is, a, it is a maze. Jan can tell you, you can get so lost. <laughs> My wife's probably greatest Honduran horror story is getting lost coming back from the morgue, okay? And coming down a hall at night, as she went to the morgue, she passed this person who people sleep on the floor everywhere all over the hospital, didn't think anything about it. Mary passed this lady, sleeping on the floor, kind of tiptoed by not to wake her up, you know, and she comes back a few minutes later, and the lady's still there, hadn't really moved. So Mary stops and kind of listens. She's dead as a doornail, okay, laying on the floor just outside the morgue, you know. We said she was headed for the morgue and didn't quite make it, you know. Um, so in the hospital rooms themselves, there's no heat and air conditioning, okay? This is Honduras. This is a balmy day out there today compared to Honduras, okay? It is hotter than the hubs of hell, as they say, and humid, okay? And 
these people, you'll still see them in their little North Face jackets when it's like 95 degrees in there. I don't understand it. They're drinking hot coffee, you know, and sweat's just pouring off me, but that's, that's just the way it is. So unlike a traditional hospital here where there are two people in every room, down there they've crammed four into every room, and that's how they get it done, okay? So the teaching goes on, you know, in the, in the wards everywhere. Honduras is an incredibly violent place. There's a huge military presence in the hospital, okay? Um, I can't tell you how many um, criminals we've treated and, and things like that. Um, so these two guys just thought it'd be fun to get their picture taken with the, with the policia. Um, remember the emergency room, Jim? The emergency room is chaos chaos okay it's not like our emergency rooms where there's somebody kind of out the front desk organized and only certain people go in and this and that this is a constant ebb and flow of people blowing in and out of here you know people get delivered to the emergency room in the back of pickup trucks and stuff like this I mean occasionally the ambulances show up but most of the time these people are coming in their own cars or they've gotten off at the bus stop and they've literally walked, limped, or been carried into the emergency room. Chaos is the only way I can tell you what this thing is like. It is just chaos. The volume of trauma and the volume of sickness that is taken care of in this place, I'm sure is way more than the total combination of Northwest Arkansas on any given day. This is Vince and Henry doing what they do best. This mother's little son that you saw in the opening picture has cancer and is being treated with chemotherapy. They are there to support her. As I said, our mission expanded very quickly beyond just those patients we were helping. My part in the mission is teaching, okay? And so um, we work with the plastic surgery residents. There is uh, one resident a year for three years. Thank goodness, one of the requirements for being a plastic surgery resident in Honduras is you gotta speak English. Because my Spanglish is terrible, okay? I mean, it is terrible. You would think after going down there 30 something times, I'd speak pretty good combat Spanish. I can speak it to them, but when they speak it back to me, I don't understand a word they say. I know I wear hearing aids in both ears, you know, uh, I, but that's just, that's just the way it is. So. We have, to have, we have to have translators or something like that. That's, that's why my daughter went down that one time. Um, so we have, we have um, hospital staff like this older gentleman. Uh, we have a medical student like the one behind me. We have um, residents, not only plastic surgery residents, but other residents who are rotating on to plastics for a month um, just to you know, see if they want to be a plastic surgeon. So. We fly down on Saturday, we get all our organization stuff done, and then on Sunday we have a clinic, okay? So let's assume that we're down there about every four or five months. So between that time, the plastic surgery clinic, the ENT clinic, and the dental clinic are all queuing up patients for us to see. So, you know, in a very busy day for ETN and me, we maybe have seen 25 patients a day, maybe. It was nothing for us to see 90 a day in this clinic, okay? Then the really tough part began because you had to decide who to prioritize. So pretty quickly, early on, we, we developed a system. Here's, here's a, one of the things I want you to appreciate. If you got told four or five months ago, oh yes, come to the clinic when, when O&L is here, those people would show up at like 7 a.m. in the hallway they didn't know that people had showed up 7 a.m. the day before in the hallway to get their place in line, okay, and would stay there literally all night the night before to try to be in the first 10 or 15 people because they sort of knew first come, first serve, you know. And especially if we had seen you more than once, say we saw you five months ago and you couldn't get in, then we kind of tried to give you priority the next time, you know, if you just kept showing up, kept showing, um, you know, interest. 
Um, so teaching is just, it's just such a huge part of it. Um, it is the teaching of the assessment of these people, teaching of the designing of the treatment for them, and then the, the operational teaching of it, and then the care afterwards, okay? Because all four of those pieces have got to fall into place to have a success. This is the first resident that completed three years with us, Claudia Cuello. Uh, this was the then chairman of the department, uh, Dr. Gonzalez, Louis Gonzalez. Uh, I remember when we graduated her, uh, this was at a time where I had pretty much quit any facial cosmetic surgery that I was doing. As her graduation gift, I remember giving her my facelift surgery set. She was just blown away. Um, so, in our priority of things, priority number one is usually trauma. The trauma in Honduras beats anything I've ever seen anywhere else in the world. There is gang violence, drug violence, um, you name it. And so, every time we ever went, we had a case like this with multiple, multiple facial fractures. And so one of our primary missions was to teach these residents how to assess this and how to reconstruct it, okay? It's basically how to put Humpty Dumpty back together again, okay? Because he's in a big old mess, okay? So this is how it's done. We have a variety of tiny little plates and screws, little metal erector set pieces, okay? They come in multiple sizes from multiple manufacturers. Um, we use a brand here in Arkansas called KLS Martin. They were very generous and they would sell us one and two generation old hardware for like 10 cents on the dollar. And we would take down literally tens of thousands of dollars at 10 cents on the dollar of hardware to Honduras. This particular case is my record case. This case has 21 plates and 74 screws, okay? It took me about seven hours to do this, okay? This was a case where this gentleman had a massive head injury. He had fractures of his frontal sinus, the sinus up here, both on the outside and on the inside. We had to take down what they call take down or cut away the inside of his frontal sinus. We had to bone graft the hole between his nose and his frontal sinus. And then we allowed his brain to then come forward against the front part of his skull. It's called cranializing the frontal sinus, okay? I've done it once in my career, okay, once. My knees were knocking, okay? But we then go and systematically put this little puzzle back together again, put all these little plates and screws in there, and then teach these residents how to do it. And they are so hungry to learn, okay? They are so hungry to learn. Um, gunshot wounds are, you know, I remember the first time we took Elizabeth down, we had two gunshot wounds the first week. She was so excited, you know, because she, she likes this stuff. She eats it up. Um, this gentleman, fortunately, suffered a fairly small caliber gunshot wound to his right jaw, okay? But look at this. As he was shot, he leaned away from the guy like this. The guy shot him. It went through his shoulder, out his shoulder, through his jaw, and into the other side. His shoulder really didn't need much more than a Band-Aid, but his jaw was kind of exploded, and he had all sorts of pieces of bone and tooth in his tongue, and he was Pretty, pretty messed up, but we got him back together. So anyway, trauma is another important part of it. Now, after we kind of get the really most teachable trauma cases done, we then turn to tumors. My gosh, I've never seen so many tumors in my life as this place has. So if you look at this on your upper left, you can see that this little boy has a very large invasive tumor of his um, sinus. And when you look at it from this view, you can see uh, that it's distorting his cheek, that it is spreading into his nose, it's eating through the roof of his mouth. Uh, and so our, our job is to go in and remove this, okay? So here's warning number one for those of you who have a squeamish, squeamish stomach, 
okay? I'm about to show you a picture of the tumor, and if you need to, close your eyes, okay? This is it. It's bigger than a tennis ball, okay? And it was in this guy's face. So what we had to do was make an incision that goes up through his lip, around through his nose, under his eye, and this is kind of colloquially called the open book approach. So you flap his face open like this, go in, cut all the tumor out, and then we had a, a dental technician come in and make us a, um, a temporary prosthesis to hold this young man's cheek out. As he healed, we did some skin grafting, uh, and then he ultimately will have a prosthesis made uh, by, the, by the dental core down there. This lovely young lady is about 26, and she thought she had a dental infection, abscess tooth, but it wouldn't go away, it wouldn't go away for months. So what we found was that she also had a very aggressive tumor that involved almost the entire right side of her jaw, okay? So what we had to do was go in and remove it from the center of her chin all the way up to where her jaw joint is. So we reconstructed her a, um, a new metal ball for her ball and joint. This then comes down and goes around. She would be back at our next visit to have bone taken from her hip and restored to this so that she would have more than just the strength of the bar. And you'd be very interested to know that when we resected the condyle, we tagged the lateral pterygoid muscle, we then sew it around the neck of the prosthesis, and they can still protrude and lateral even though they have a totally metallic joint. I just thought that sounded like a good idea. <laughs> you know. Okay, this sad looking fella has a disease known as von Recklinghausen's neurofibromatosis. Maybe you saw ages ago the old movie Elephant Man, okay? Well, um, this guy was a wonderful person, but he was profoundly handicapped by his appearance and came to us to see what we could do. And so after looking at him and studying him for a while, I said, well, I think we can excise this and basically we're going to take an approach like this is going to be the world's biggest facelift, okay? So that's what we did. Oh, I should have given you another warning, sorry, another, another squeamish warning, okay. This is after we've excised all the tumor and I've taken the facial skin that he had left and draped it back in hope that I was going to be able to sew this thing closed, okay, because it was a big old hole. But as you can see, we actually had enough that we were even covering his ear, so I trimmed a little bit more and we sewed him up and this is what he looks like the next day. Okay, this is one happy camper, let me tell you. He was asking the nurses for dates, okay? <laughs> the, the, the day after his surgery, he was ready to get back in the game. His, his world was changed, okay? His world was changed. This is something I had never seen in the United States in, at that time, probably 25 years of practice. This is called... Uh, Romberg's hemifacial atrophy. These are people who, until they're five or six years old, look very normal. Then their face begins to wither for really no apparent reason, okay? In cases like this, we were able to come back and we would harvest fat and fat graft their faces to, to recontour them. Um, this is one of the two greatest residents we ever had. The other resident was Carlos I, this is Carlos II, okay? Carlos II, when he was chief resident and I, decided we were gonna do a study on Romberg patients, and we were gonna see how many we could find, okay? So we spread the word over about a year, and 41 different Romberg patients showed up at the hospital, okay? He said, they want me to write an article about this, so he and I offered, authored an article in the South American Journal of Plastic Surgery. Our group of 41 was the second largest known collection of patients in the world, okay? 
bless their heart, these poor people, I mean, they have enough things going against them, and then they have something like this, you know, piled in on top of it. Um, so you can see it also can affect your upper uh, face with literally withering of your skull. We did biopsies, we did all these studies, and basically we hit a huge financial wall. The University of Tennessee helped us a whole bunch, but when it got to the point where we were going to have to have special electron microscopy and all this, gosh, the bill was going to be hundreds of thousands of dollars, and so we kind of had to abandon finding, finding the why and just deal with the treatment of it. But anyway, so you can have a big defect like this, and thank goodness, we have a, a bone putty cement material that we can go in. And you can see just a hint of where her defect used to be, okay? But we go in and make an incision across the top of the head, fold everything down, go in and sort of sculpt this back to where it looks good again, and then sew it back up, okay? Uh, it's a big deal for these people. It's a big deal for them. Okay, the, 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 the final part, after we've kind of dealt with the trauma and the pathology, is the, is the facial deformity surgery, and it's, nah, I mean, I, it sounds crazy, but I like it all, okay? I enjoy doing all of it, but this is the stuff that's really meaningful because we can change these people's lives. So uh, you'll notice that I haven't talked any at all about cleft lip and palate, okay? Uh, that work is done primarily by two other organizations. One's called Pro Smile Train, and one's called Operation Smile. And they did the majority of the lips and the palates, which is fine for me. I don't like doing them. Um, but most of you are familiar with the cleft lip and palate, okay? I bet you didn't know that there are actually 14 facial clefts, okay? From a 0, 14 cleft that runs through the center of your face, okay, to, to other ones. This, if you look at her eye on your right, um, this is the manifestation of a nine facial cleft that is a nasal orbital cleft. And if you look at her from the side, you can see that at one point she had a cleft that ran from her mouth completely to her ear, okay? That's a seven facial cleft, okay? I've never seen a seven facial cleft. I can't tell you how many I've seen, okay? It is, it is so... It is so rampant uh, down there. Facial deformities and cleft particular are a little bit higher in the Hispanic population than in the Anglo population. You add to that the fact that maternal nutrition is terrible. These people live on rice, beans, tortillas, and if they're lucky, they get a little bit of fruit, okay? They live on a subsistence diet, and so the prenatal nutrition for these kids who are already predisposed to these problems is just, it's, a, it's abysmal. So we had a whole, whole lot of this. Um, this little girl has the only time I've ever seen this. This is another manifestation of facial clefting. When her face formed, she didn't form any nose any upper jaw to speak of, um, any anterior orbit. This is called Bender's syndrome. It's the only one I've, I've, I've ever seen. She was actually brought back to the States. Um, we worked out a deal with um, LSU where she was brought back to the States. They took a flap of tissue from her forward and rotated it down to create her a nose. They then went in and did bone grafting support of that to rebuild her mid-face. And she is vastly improved, but unfortunately, since I wasn't involved in any of that um, treatment, I don't have post-op pictures. But I've never seen anything like this. So one of the most common things we saw is this thing called hemifacial microsomia. So half your face is micro, okay? Didn't grow, didn't develop, doesn't do what you want what you want it to. Now, oddly, again, I went down there thinking, okay, I know what hemifacial microsomia is. Okay, but what do you call it when it's on both sides? <laughs> you can't call it bilateral hemifacial microsomia, you know, that doesn't really make much sense. But anyway, anyway, we saw that. So, 
I'd been going probably four or five years when on like midweek these parents stopped me in the hall with this screaming little girl and in their Spanish they're trying to get me to take a look at her and when you look at her you can see that very much like the little blonde girl that I showed you she doesn't have an ear her jaw and face are all swung off to one side and so she has the very classic hemifacial microsomia okay she's about mm, two or three here really too young for us to operate so we told mom and dad come back well, they came back every time we were down there till she finally got old enough for us to do something for her, okay? So, this is a picture of what your normal jaw looks like. You can see the ball in the socket, and if you look right here, here's her ear, okay? And this is her normal jaw right here, okay? Here's her other side. Whoop, no ear at all. No jaw at all, no socket, no nothing. So we had to figure out how could we give her a jaw, straighten her face, uh, and allow her some chance at, at growing normally. So there, there's a technique called distraction osteogenesis, where you make a bony cut, you put this little erector set device on there, and you move that bone a half millimeter twice a day, slowly, slowly, slowly. And as you do, the bone grows and grows and grows so that that piece that used to sit right here, I've now taken and pushed all the way up against the base of her skull. It doesn't show real well, but this has, this has straightened her face and restored you're going to see really restore her self-confidence tremendously. Once this heals for about six weeks, then the hardware comes out. Someone way smarter than me figured out that this comes off very easily. You take these four little screws out, and this big long rod just kind of detaches and comes out. So she, she goes around with a little bitty piece up there the rest of her life, but that's you know not a big deal. Um, so this is what we got. We got a little girl with a straight face, not screaming at me anymore, which was good, okay? And to the point that she was self-aware enough now that even though her ear doesn't look like an ear, she's still wearing an earring in it, okay? She, she is restored. You can see she's a pretty little girl. Look at those eyes. She is a pretty, pretty, pretty little girl. And we followed her for probably four or five years, and she has now continued to grow normally, okay? So, um, this has been an incredible experience. 14 years, maybe 30 trips. Uh, I was telling Dr. Vanzel the other day, it's the most meaningful thing I've done in my 40 years of practice. Um, I worked at Arkansas Children's on the cleft craniofacial team for, gosh, years. And that was good, but it wasn't this good, okay? So I would encourage you, oh, oh, let me tell you a couple other things, a couple other things. So Operation New Life, o &L, sadly no longer exists. Several years ago, all but our maxillofacial unit merged with the Christian and Medical Dental Association out of North Carolina. The, the administrative burden, the fundraising, all that got to be more than our little cadre of people were willing to do, except for us and our little group, and Dr. Alfonso and I just did it. Okay, we just did it. Um, but COVID and Dr. Alfonso's retirement and then my retirement has really dealt uh, a death blow to the maxillofacial portion and now what is done is only done in a much more limited way um, through Christian Medical and Dental. Um, we have not had a team in there since before COVID. COVID destroyed healthcare in Honduras. It just destroyed it. They don't know how many people died. You know, they don't know how many people died. And so um, everybody, nobody, including me, is willing to go down there and stick their nose into that hornet's nest right now. Hopefully that's going to settle out some, but, w but we really don't know. 
But anyway, my point to you is this. Be proud of this because this is an Arkansas-founded, Arkansas-run um, organization that ministered to these people physically, spiritually, really giving it the very best we had to offer for 14 years. And so uh, thank you for giving me the time to, uh, to talk to you about it because it's been a real passion of mine. Okay. Any, any questions? Anybody want to talk about any of this? I don't, I'm happy to go back and show you some pictures or, you know, and believe me, boy, this is not my typical lecture. I cut a lot of the blood and guts out of this <laughs> just so it would be appropriate for church, <laughs> you know. Uh, but, if, you know, anyway, okay. Anything else? All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. You know, I think what I take away from it, I, I don't have the medical skills. I don't have the hand that can do what you and your, your team did. But I think God has given each of us something we can do somewhere in our lives. And I, I think that's my takeaway. It is amazing what physicians and anesthesiologists and, and dentists can do. But each of us is given something that we can do. So that's my takeaway as well. Let's pray if we... Heavenly Father, we thank you for the dedication of, of individuals who, who say, Lord, you have given me a skill and you have put a burden in my heart to use it where it's needed and needed a lot. And so we thank you for the willingness of Dr. Lewis and so many individuals and companies to make a difference in the lives of people that they didn't even know. And so, Lord, may we have that same passion in our lives as we leave here today. May we uh, ask you to put a burden in our hearts for something, for someone, that we can make a difference in their lives as well. And so now, Lord, as we continue on, as we enjoy our meal together, we ask your blessing on it as well. And again, thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day. In my name, amen. Please stay for potluck.